We welcome you to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. The message was preached on the date indicated. The music was recorded previously. May God bless you as you join us in worship and in the study of God's Word. All who are thirsty All who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away of His mercy as deep cries out to Thee. Come, Lord Jesus, We've reached our second last message from the letter of Paul to the church in Rome. Throughout this series, I've been following Steve Gregg's thought that this letter was written to deal with friction between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. And last week, we saw Paul's suggestion for relieving the tension between the groups. While the Jews were learning to break free from the restrictions of the Old Covenant, and their traditions, the Gentiles were to be patient and not to flaunt their freedom under the new covenant. Keep in mind that this was doubly hard for the Jews. What seems obvious to us, that Gentiles can become followers of the Messiah Jesus, was not so obvious at that time. Jesus was their Messiah, after all, prophesied, by their holy scriptures, born a Jew. So I think we can understand why Paul would once again seem to be justifying his ministry among the Gentiles. 
For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. When we think of Jesus, we often think of him as Lord and King. And he is our Lord. He is our King. But Paul reminded them that Christ became a servant. This is one of the remarkable truths of Christianity, that our God humbled himself and came to us in the form of a man named Jesus. He became a servant of the circumcised, that is to say, the Jews. But Jesus came to the Jews in order to reach beyond the Jews, to the nations around them, to the Gentile nations. It had always been possible for a Gentile to become a Jew and join with God's people. But there was never more than a trickle. And God had a bigger plan in mind. And the result was that the Gentiles also glorified God for his mercy on them, for his salvation. The Gentiles coming to God through Jesus was one of the promises given to Abraham and confirmed to his descendants. These patriarchs of the Old Covenant were given the promise that in Abraham's seed, meaning in Jesus, all the nations would be blessed. So God proved to be truthful when the Gentiles were blessed because of the Messiah, or Christ, whom God had sent. They were blessed when they found salvation in Jesus. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Now when Paul wrote, As it is written, he meant that he would be quoting from the Old Testament. And Paul's quotes are usually from the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation. In this case he was quoting from 2 Samuel 22.50, and Psalm 18, 49. But by writing as it is written, he also meant that he was about to prove his point from the Old Testament. He was going to prove that bringing salvation to the Gentiles was part of God's plan. Paul's first quote is about praising God and singing to the name of God. But where? Among the Gentiles. Now David wrote this psalm after he had defeated his enemies. And David could praise God among the nations because he had defeated them. And we can understand that the nations who were conquered by Israel could become part of God's people in those days. And for that reason they too could praise God. In verse 10, Paul quoted from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32:43. It's a song of victory, but with an invitation to the Gentiles to rejoice together with God's people, Israel. Now, it may seem strange to think that the Gentiles, the, the nations, would rejoice in their own defeat. However, when you think about it, that's what we do personally. We let God conquer us when we invite Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, and as he takes over our lives, we rejoice. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Verse 11 quotes from the shortest psalm, Psalm 117. And here there's no talk of victory over the Gentiles, but just an invitation for the nations around Israel to praise the Lord. In verse 12, Paul quoted from Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 10. Both verses refer to the descendant of Jesse, who was the father of King David. They refer to the coming Messiah or Christ, 
And Paul applied these prophecies to Jesus. In the Greek Old Testament, the word translated hope here is translated trust. And with either word, Paul was showing us that it's prophesied that the Gentiles would turn to Jesus and that he would rule over them. And so Paul made it clear that Jesus, the one who descended from Jesse, the father of King David, is the Messiah, or Christ, for the Gentiles as well. I want to draw your attention to something else we can learn here. First, Paul quoted from all three parts of the Jewish Bible, our Old Testament. He quoted from Deuteronomy, which is part of the law, from Isaiah, who was one of the prophets, and from the Psalms, which is part of the sacred writings. Paul wanted the Jewish readers to know that the Gentiles were part of the church of Jesus Christ in fulfillment of God's word to Israel as it was found throughout the Old Testament. Taking the gospel to the Gentiles was not plan B. It was part of God's plan all along. There's something else I want to draw to your attention. According to the most popular understanding of the end times, this prophecy in Isaiah 11 refers to the millennium. They believe that during the future time, that future time, Jesus will impose a peace so wonderful that the lamb and the wolf will live together and a child will lead a calf and a lion. We see that described in verse 6 and others in this chapter. But that's not what this prophecy is about. Notice that this wonderful, peaceful time is prophesied between verses 1 and 10. This entire prophecy, including that wonderful peace, was and is fulfilled already when the peoples or the nations, meaning the Gentiles, come to Jesus. Remember that Jesus is the shoot coming from the root of Jesse. So if this isn't about a future millennium, then what's the connection between a peaceful time and the Gentiles coming to Jesus? I think it was Steve Gregg who made the point that in many Old Testament prophecies, the Gentile nations are pictured as dangerous wild animals, threatening God's people. So Isaiah described peace with the Gentiles happening when God tamed them. God would tame the dangerous nations who were the enemies of God's people under the rule of the Messiah, the descendant of Jesse. And Isaiah's prophecy is already fulfilled in the church since Jesus' first coming. Since the eleven apostles and Paul first preached the gospel to the Gentiles, countless Gentiles have been brought, in, brought under the lordship of Jesus, the Messiah. We've become part of the Israel of God, which is how Paul describes that in Galatians chapter 6. To use Paul's picture from Romans 11, those of us who are Gentiles have been grafted like wild olive branches onto the domestic Jewish olive tree. Now speaking of taming wild animals, I have no doubt that in the resurrection, when God gives us new bodies and puts us on a new earth, all the animals will be tame. But this prophecy is about the Gentiles coming to Jesus Christ, their hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Referring again to hope, Paul wrote that this blessing to the believers in Rome, wrote this blessing to them, most of whom were Gentiles. His blessing was that the God of hope would fill them with joy and peace. And that joy and peace would come through believing. Please be careful here with this word believing. 
This doesn't mean that our belief creates joy and peace in us. That kind of idea, the idea that if you just believe, it will happen, that's something quite popular in our day. Adults and children, too, are taught that they can be or do whatever they want if they just believe in themselves. Now, there is some worldly advantage to having confidence. But Paul was talking spiritually. Spiritually, believing in ourselves is useless. If we want real joy and peace, they will come through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ whom God has sent, he is the one to believe in. In him, we will have an abundance of hope. I'm, I myself am satisfied about you, brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder. Here, Paul declared himself to be satisfied about the believers in Rome in three areas. First, that they were full of goodness. We would want that said about us. And second, they were filled with all knowledge. It seems that most of them knew the gospel well. The third's a little more difficult. Paul wrote that they were able to instruct one another, which makes it sound like they were all able to be teachers. But as we've seen in other scriptures, not everyone should be teachers. Besides, if they were all teachers, who would be the students? The more usual translation for the Greek word instead of instruct is admonish. It has the idea of gently correcting someone for their behavior or their conduct. And we all need that at times. Having said that he was satisfied with them on these points, Paul wrote that there were other points about which he'd had to write boldly. Not that they didn't know those things as well, but that they needed a reminder, just as we often do. And we have seen that boldness in Paul's letter. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly office of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by his Holy Spirit. He continued by explaining why he had written so boldly. Because he was a minister to the Gentiles. He corrected the Gentiles, of course, but he had to care for them by boldly correcting the Jews. Notice that Paul said he had this ministry to the Gentiles by the grace of God. And that's the way we should think of our ministries as well. Do you have a ministry of encouragement? Do you have a ministry of working with children? Do you have a ministry of music? Do you have a ministry of practical work at the church? Whatever it is, let's not think of it as a chore or as hard work, even if it is at times. Instead, let's think of it as a gift graciously given to us by God, as a privilege. He described his ministry as a priestly service. Now, we know that all believers are priests. We can go directly to God through Jesus Christ. But I think that Paul was describing something else. Priests would offer gifts to God. And Paul described himself as offering the Gentiles as an acceptable offering. And of course, to be an acceptable offering, they had to be sanctified or holy. We know that Paul was speaking about a church that he was ministering to by way of this letter. But what about us? We too are to be acceptable offerings to God. As he said in Romans 12, 1, we're to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. If we want to be an acceptable offering to God, then we have to be holy. It's God the Holy Spirit who has the power to do that in our lives if we allow him to do so.
if we invite him to do so. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, we usually associate pride with boasting, and rightly so. But Paul was not patting himself on the back. He was saying that he was proud of what Christ had achieved through him. He wasn't saying that the success was his. He was giving credit to God. And that's the only thing that he would talk about. He wrote of words and deeds, of signs and wonders, and of the power of the Spirit of God who makes it possible. And notice that obedience is part of the gospel. The person who knows Jesus as Savior knows that he has saved them from guilt and from the power of sin. That person wants to live gratefully for him. And the person who knows Jesus as Lord knows that he has the right to tell us what to do and how to live. And so that person is obedient. So that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Now, Illyricum was northwest of Macedonia, in the area we know as the Balkans. Having fulfilled his mission in that part of the world, Paul wanted to go further afield, to other parts of the empire. He didn't want to be building on the work started by someone else. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul quoted this verse from Isaiah 52, Verse 15. His point was that by taking the gospel to those who didn't know about Jesus, they would see and understand. And that's why we send out missionaries and why we preach the gospel to the people around us. This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, And since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. Now the fact that there was already a church in Rome may have hindered Paul since he wanted to start new churches. In any case, now that he'd finished his work in the east, he planned to travel west to Spain. He hoped to enjoy a visit with them when he went through Rome, and he hoped that they would be able to help him on his journey. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. It's believed that Paul was writing from Ephesus, which is regarded as his headquarters. He had this contribution from the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, both parts of Greece, to give to the poor believers in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings." Now, Paul writes that the Gentile believers were happy to share some of their resources with the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, with the mother church, so to speak. Why did the Gentiles owe the Jews in Jerusalem? Remember that Paul is talking about the saints, that is to say, their fellow believers in Christ. The saints in Jerusalem were very poor. For whatever reasons, they were in need of money. Notice that Paul didn't say to the Gentiles in Greece that they were to give to the believers in Jerusalem because they were in need of charity. 
He didn't say that they were sharing with them because people who have should share with those who have not. And that's true. Instead, Paul said that the Gentile churches should share financially with the Jewish churches because the Jews were first to have the gospel and they shared the gospel with the Gentiles. In other words, since the Gentiles had been blessed spiritually by the message coming from the church in Jerusalem, it was only right they should bless the believers in Jerusalem materially. But be careful. Some Christians take this verse to mean that Christians in our day should give to national Israel, to non-believing Jews. Now, if there's a disaster in Israel, it is appropriate to help with our fellow man in this time of crisis, just as we would do with a disaster in any part of the world. And it's also appropriate to support missions and missionaries who take the gospel to the people of Israel and to the Jews anywhere in the world. They absolutely need the gospel. But let's not waste our money giving to unchristian people to support an unchristian agenda. Paul's principle is that those who receive good things spiritually should share good things materially. And in this case, the Gentile Christians had received the gospel from the Jewish Christians, and so they, so they owed it to them to care for them. When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So Paul repeated his travel plans. He planned to come in the full blessing of Christ on his way to Spain. But he was wrong. He would go to Rome, not on his way to Spain, but to be judged by the Emperor Nero. He would be captured in Jerusalem for disturbing the peace, and imprisoned until he finally appealed to Caesar. And so when he did arrive, he was in chains, and he never made it to Spain. I mention this because we have plans, sometimes very good ones, but they can be derailed. Sometimes we plan something, something very good even, but God has other plans for us. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Paul wanted them to pray for him and with him. He considered that to be striving or working together with him. Our prayers on behalf of a ministry are a way of working for that ministry, as Christian missions and missionaries would, would agree. Paul's prayer would, was that he would be delivered from unbelievers in Judea, where he was headed. Instead, he was harassed by the Jewish leaders and eventually turned over to the Roman authorities. So that prayer wasn't answered with a yes. And Paul also wanted them to pray that the monetary gift he was taking to the believers in Jerusalem would be acceptable. I was surprised by that request. I have to think that if their contribution wasn't acceptable, the problem would not be with Paul, the messenger, or with the givers. So that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul wanted their prayers so that he would be able to go with them or go to them with joy and that he would be refreshed or encouraged by their company. Notice that he prayed that it would happen by God's will. And that's not a bad thing to pray. It's a recognition that we can get it wrong. It's possible to pray something for ourselves or others, that's not really a part of God's plan. And he closed the body of his letter with a benediction, that the God of peace would be with them 
And notice that he didn't pray that God would make their situation peaceful, but that but the God of peace can give us peace, peace of heart in difficult situations. Let us pray. Our Father, we see that Paul was much like us, that he had good plans for ministry, but you had other plans. Help us to submit to your will for our lives and help us to rest in your peace, whatever may be our situation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.